This regular, this regular meeting of the Judson Board of Trustees is hereby called to order at 7, 7 p.m. I am very pleased that you've taken time to join us this evening. As the Judson Board of Trustees, we are here to set goals and policies and oversee the management of the district. We are responsible for approving budgets, contracts, personnel appointments, and to listen to reports from the superintendent. We are not here to make administrative or management decisions pertaining to the daily operations of the district. This is the responsibility of the superintendent. In compliance with the state government code on open meetings, tonight's agenda has been appropriately posted. This is a meeting in public, not a meeting of the public. As our guests, you are welcome to observe and listen. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded and will become part of Judson's permanent legal record. In order that the tape adequately reflects these proceedings, please silence your mobile devices and refrain from talking while others are speaking. Since it is legally mandated that these proceedings are recorded accurately, I may have to ask for order periodically should I notice that disruptions are interfering with our recording capabilities. Once again, I extend to each of you a sincere welcome from the entire school board. Thank you for your interest in Judson ISD. We have established a quorum and I will call roll. Ms. Eaton. Present. Ms. Pichelle. Present. Mr. Macias. Present and welcome. Ms. Kenoyer. Present. Good evening, all. Mr. LaFoyle. President, thank you for coming. And I am Dr. Melinda Salinas. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And to my left, we have our superintendent of schools, Dr. Jeanette Ball. Welcome. Um, if you will please rise for Pledge of Allegiance. Item two, recognitions. We do not have any recognitions this evening. We will move on to item three, acknowledgement of visitors and citizens to be heard. This time is provided for citizens to address the board on issues or concerns. A person may speak one time for a period of three minutes. Presentations shall be informative only. No board action will be taken. A complaint or charge against an officer or employee of the district is not allowed in open session. Complaints and concerns should first be addressed by campus and or district administration. If your topic involves a personnel matter, a student matter, or if you contend that your legal rights have been violated or board policy not followed, we have specific grievance procedures, DGBA legal and local for these matters, and now is not the appropriate time to discuss these matters. Also, as a reminder, you are not allowed to refer to any individual by name. We respectfully ask that you refrain from making personal attacks or rude or slanderous remarks or becoming boisterous. The presiding officer shall determine whether a person who wishes to address the board has attempted to solve a matter administratively. If not, the person shall be directed to the appropriate policy to seek resolution before bringing the matter to the board at a subsequent meeting. Citizens wishing to receive a response from concerns presented to the board must provide written documentation. The board shall not deliberate or decide regarding any subject that is not included on the agenda posted with notice of the meeting. And tonight we have Tom Patterson, and the agenda item to be discussed is trauma-informed education. Trauma-informed education. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I came here to talk about two movies, uh, documentary movies, that I saw this year pertaining to the subject of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, ACEs, or more colloquially known as toxic stress. The movies were called Resilience, the Biology of Stress and the Science of Hope, and the other movie was called Paper Tigers. Um, they were 
Uh, primarily dealing with uh, some situations in the state of Washington. This is one of the, the first places to uh, really accept the, uh, the, the new science and institute some policies that uh, reflect that. Um, in the county of Cowlitz, um, they instituted trauma-informed policies and they saw reductions of 47% in dropout rates among students, 53% reduction of youth arrests for violent crime, 62% in teenage pregnancy, 43% in infant mortality, and 98% of teenage suicide attempts. Um, they have projected a long-term savings to taxpayers of $300 million from an investment of $8.1 million. Uh, that information was uh, in the Resilience movie. And then in Paper Tigers, uh, that was a, a piece about a, an alternative school, Lincoln High School in Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, one of the very first schools to institute trauma-informed policies. And uh, over a four-year period, they saw an 83% reduction in suspensions, 40% reduction in expulsions, 47% reduction in written referrals, graduation rates were up five times, and uh, the number of students starting college went up three times. And uh, I just wanted to make the recommendation if uh, board members have never had the opportunity to see those movies that they uh, set aside the time to look at them. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that come out that are, you know, theoretical in a, a psychological realm, but with the, the actual measured numbers that they've seen, I think this is something that would be very valuable to our students. Thank you. We have no further citizens to be heard. We'll move on to item to consideration of consent items. Please let me know if you'd like an item poll. 4A, consider and take action regarding approving minutes from the special board meetings held May 30th, June 4th, June 5th, June 12th, June 13th, and June 18th, 2018. 4B, consider and take action regarding approving the monthly financial information as of June 30th, 2018. I am pulling that item. 4C, consider and take action regarding approving the cash investment report for all funds as of June 30th, 2018. 4D, consider and take action regarding approving of expenditures equal to or greater than $50,000. 4E, consider and take action regarding approving the cooperative purchasing management fees report. 4F, consider and take action regarding approving the ranking for, of the engineering firms for services related to the material testing phase of the construction at Kirby Middle School. 4G, consider and take action regarding approving the ranking of the submittals for request for proposal 18-32, Candlewood Fire Alarm Upgrade. 4H, consider and take action regarding approving the ranking of submittals for the request for competitive sealed proposal 18-33, Veterans Memorial High School Athletic Fields. 4I, consider and take action regarding approving requests for proposal 18-35, excess workers' compensation insurance. 4J, consider and take action regarding approving a Texas Education Agency TEA expedited waiver for foreign exchange student program. 4K, consider and take action regarding approving the interlocal cooper cooperation contract on cybersecurity academy and corresponding summer camps. Okay, uh, we will be voting on, or we will, if I can have a motion on for A, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J. Motion. Second. Motion, Ms. Pichelle, second, Mr. LaFoyle. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6 0. We'll move on to 4B, consider and take action regarding approving the monthly financial information as of June 30th, 2018. Do I have a motion? Second. second. Motion, Ms. Knoyer. <laughs> second, Mr. LaFoyle. I just have a couple of questions. I don't expect administration to have the responses now, but if they could get the responses for us. 
on page, let's see, the first one is on page, oh, I don't know what page it's on. There are no pages. Okay. Well, at the top it says it has a name, Nina Mavernack. My question is not about N Nina. It's about Patricia Anun Anunzio. Consultant Patricia Anunzio will be coaching teachers in the classroom to prepare students for the STAR test at a, oh. I said B. Oh, I see 38. Okay, yes, oh, I'm I sorry. The odd number pages, or maybe it got hole punched. Perhaps. Thank you. Page 37. Just a question about the star testing at $100 an hour for two and a half hours for seven days. Um, just dates and school. I know it says June 14th, but that was after the star test, unless it's for summer. I don't know. And then I don't know if it's elementary or middle school or high school. So just, just extra information. And then the next one is on page 40, the very bottom for Region 20. Mm -hmm. We have two items for approximately $26,000 for up to 65 days each one, so a max of 130 days. Classroom observation and coaching, debriefing district-wide. Just again, curious, did we really have 130 days out of 177 student days? Or how many days, and again, what campuses, and and that those are my only questions. Yes, Mr. Macias. Yeah, I would also ask that when um, when we do the consultants and services, what that um, measurability looks like. I mean, everything that we're spending needs to be measurable in some capacity. So what does that return look like? What are we getting comparative to if we went another direction? Uh, it, that's, I don't know what that would look like, and, and obviously I've not considered asking, so thank you, Dr. Salinas, for pulling it. But it still goes to our consulting dollars. Are we spending them as wisely as possible? So what sort of measurability is there in terms of impact in the classroom? Anyone else? If there's no further discussion, we'll proceed to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Move on to item 4K, consider and take action regarding approving the interlocal cooperation contract on Cybersecurity Academy and corresponding summer camps. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Motion, Ms. Pichel. Second, Mr. Macias and Ms. Pichel. This is your item. Thank you, Dr. Salinas. Um, Dr. Ball, the only reason why I pulled this was because I wanted to have an explanation. And then I see when we got here tonight, there is a, a correction to what we already have. And so may I please hear um, what, why we have another one, what the correction is, and, and just to explain what it is, this interlocal agreement. Thank you. Did everybody get one? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. Let me answer the first part of the question. Um, what is this agreement or the interlocal agreement? This agreement was already previously approved um, July 21st of uh, 2016. It is a three-year contract with UTSA. This is the program and the partnership that we have. It's housed at uh, we Veterans Memorial High School um, for cybersecurity. And if you will note, the contract outlines in the uh, statement of services, this is for students to attend a summer camp. The reason that we're bringing it back to the board, even though it was already approved, is because a number of students changed. Uh, originally, we were looking up to 60 students, but after the recruitment and uh, identifying the students, if you look at section four on page 104, the copy that's in your binder identifies 32 students. And we received notice from UTSA after the board um, agenda was submitted that the final calculation is 35 students. So that's the only difference in having a second copy of the interlocal contract. Thank you, Dr. You're very welcome. There's no further discussion. We'll proceed to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. 
Move on to item 5A, consider and take possible action regarding approval of the personnel report and updates including new hires, resignations, and administrative appointments. One, principals. We will discuss that or we will um, take action um, after we come out of closed session. B and C have been pulled by administration. D. Dr. Salinas. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. I have some questions about the IB program. Can we pull that as a discussion? Sure, go ahead. You can talk. Yeah, we yeah we can we can downgrade it to discussion only. It's on okay. the agenda, so we won't take any action on it. But we certainly can discuss it. Okay. I, I would just like to say that the reason that I pulled this is because I haven't had the opportunity to fully discuss this with my staff. Being my fourth day here, I, it has gone by. Every day goes very quickly, and this week I chose to meet with as many principals as possible. So I, ha I will not be prepared um, to discuss too much, but I will certainly listen to any discussion. That's perfect. Um, I, I've had um, some perspective regarding the IB program. And so obviously if you're garnering information. Don't, you wanna, don't we have to amend the motion? No, it's just a discussion. There's, I, it's not a. I think you either have to make a motion or you have to suspend the rules. Consider and take possible action. Okay. I'll, uh, okay. Go ahead, somebody. Uh, I, I move that we discuss IB program. Okay, so we have a motion to amend the item. I mean, I, I think all you need to do is take a motion and then second it, have your discussion, okay. and then have them withdraw their motions and we just bring it back at the next meeting. Okay. All right. Go ahead, discussion, Mr. Macias. Yes, thank you. And I only want to take advantage since it's on the agenda. I didn't realize it wouldn't be pulled or I would have been more prepared. Um, but I know that we've had some discussion regarding this and in your fact finding, I mean, perspective from the board in terms of where we ended up, I recall. Um, a statement that Mr. Elizondo had shared with us when I asked him about it, I can't remember when now, it was last month maybe, about the IB program being reinstated. My impression was that we were phasing the program out. And that's, that's correct, right? So we were phasing the program out, but to understand what um, the perspective was back then is important for you to, to see, at least from my standpoint, and naturally my colleagues can also <laughs> say whatever they need to say regarding it. But the fact of the matter is that the program was, was expensive in terms of the amount of students that were impacted uh, regarding um, the return on investment. So uh, my support of phasing the program out was specific to the fact that we have a dual credit program that um, we're putting a lot of energy into, that, that we're deriving the same impact of college coursework for students um, at, a, at a better cost per student ratio than the IB. I love the whole concept with IB, but when I saw the data and we discussed it, I um, was concerned about its impact. And we're talking in the teens in terms of the amount of students that are truly getting something out of the IB program. So um, tough decisions were made. Uh, I know the board had discussed it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what is brought back, but you know if it's going to be more cost effective or whatever that might look like. But naturally, um, my reservations were when we're scaling down dollars, what's going to have the biggest bang for our dollar? And so dual credit or early college with JECA, that sort of seemed to be the, the best investment for all students as opposed to only the cohort of students in that program. So uh, I'll be interested to see, but I just wanted to share my perspective regarding that item. I appreciate that. Um, I just need a little more time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Macias, I did notice that um, it said it will be taken from JHS budget. So it won't be, you know, district funds. It will be the high school budget. And that's a good question um, from Judson budget, but is there district dollars in terms of personnel that are attributed to that? And I would imagine that there would be. So is that correct, Mr. Elizondo? Yeah, yes, sir. All the funds that um, Judson High School receives are district funds. 
I just, oh, go ahead. Yes, Ms. Eaton. Have we um, possibly looked into accepting any grants for the program? You know, I know we talked about it and made a decision about changing it, but grants and or perhaps a tuition type situation, either one. And, and that's, there's a lot of questions that I also have, so that's why I was asking a little more time. Does anyone else have any comments? Uh, my, my only comment is that when we first talked about this, I guess two or three, two years ago, three years ago, it was at a program review, mm -hmm. and it was because we, we didn't, okay, yes, we phased out the program, but really there were two positions where teachers were being paid and were not teaching students and they were receiving stipends for extra duty and not having extra duty. That's what, that was the concern, was the money that was spent on two personnel units that weren't touching any students. And I, you know what I, when I say touching, I don't, I mean working with them uh, directly. Um, and so that was, that was the concern. Since then, they have, I think those two units or those stipends have gone, correct? Not sure if the stipends have gone, but definitely they have changed the manner in which they right. um, run the program mm -hmm. and to ensure that everybody's teaching students. So they've been able to run the program with less, correct? And run it actually more effectively than it had been run 20 years <laughs> prior, the last, the last um, three years. Um, I did question this, and Mr. Macias was there when we were reviewing this agenda item, questioning why are we, as a board, um, having to vote on a, on a program that a school can sustain on their own. Um, and that was my question because I don't believe that that is our role. Um, now, if we're going to put in a program that's going to cost more units, that we're going to have to then expend more funds, absolutely, because that's going to affect our budget. Um, so I questioned why it was even on here, mm -hmm. but I was told that, well, we voted out the program, and I'm like, well, we actually voted out the units because they weren't being effectively um, put in place. So that's my only comment, again, for you to look into and research, and maybe it doesn't have to come back. I don't know. Thank you. So Dr. Salinas, you're suggesting that this may not come back to the agenda? I'm suggesting, and I, I, I you know, I was, I've asked several different people, like, would you, would you typically have a board vote on that? And they said, no, not if it's, if, dis if camp campuses have a lot of programs that they have right now that they put in place because their campus improvement plan or their site-based decision-making, decided to try it. Right. And so we don't, we don't, we don't get to. to tell them yes or no, you can't do that. And so that was my. Well, I guess it's appropriate to ask then if there is personnel that's coming from district funds. I mean, that comes from a budget that we support. All, all personnel does. Well, and so in that vein, if we're approving that budget, uh, I would imagine that we would have an opportunity to evaluate if that's something that, that needs to be. If it's purely programmatic, programmatic which I know campuses can do that, that's cool, but if a dollar is coming out of personnel, then it's a district expense, at least that's my impression. So uh, I, would, I would probably want to see this on an agenda for us to discuss so that I'm comfortable with our, our approach with this program. We can definitely review it again. Um, when we were gonna, when it was discussed about bringing this back, I w I'm the one who suggested that we bring it back to the board specifically because it was, uh, board, it was brought to the board when it was uh, phased out and so we don't want what I didn't think was a good idea was for the board to tell us or to agree not to pursue a program and then we decided we're going to do it anyway um, so I always felt like when we're going to do that that it would be better to bring it to the board for full transparency that hey we talked about this program uh, at one point in time it was decided that we were not going to do this and now we'd like to reevaluate and reinstate the program and have the board give us their okay to go back and do something that the board told us not to do at one point, whether it was part of a budget process or anything else that when we say, even when we're gonna cut a position, if we cut the position and the board is part of the budget process, before we add it back, we're gonna bring it back to the board and say, we'd like to bring this back, is it okay to do that? Um, so that's the reason it's coming back. And yes, all the, while this may be budgeted, it still costs district funds. And so if the board were to say, nope, we're not gonna pursue this, we don't wanna do this, then we would adjust the budget downward and say, okay, we're gonna delete all these positions and uh, we're gonna do something else with that, those resources. these teachers don't only teach IB, so it's not as easy as it sounds of just deleting the position. And they have contracts for this next year. 
So they'd have to be, loads, they'd have to do something. With yep. full, right, sure. with seven periods or however many classes they have to teach. Well, the IB would be one of the seven if they, yeah. We're getting, I mean, it's almost too late for this year, my opinion. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. We'll move on to item 5D. Consider and take possible action regarding possible approval of an employee retention incentive to be paid during the 18-19 fiscal year. Do I have a motion? Motion. Second. Motion, Ms. Knoyer. Second, Ms. Pichel. Uh, Dr. Ball. Oh, no. Okay. Nope. <laughs> sure. No problem. Um, at the uh, budget uh, adoption, um, there was a discussion that was uh, that took place regarding um, putting in place a retention incentive program for our employees, and we budgeted, the board budgeted, approved $1.8 million for that purpose, and this particular recommendation um, is being brought forth so they can generate discussion for the board members to see if uh, the parameters that are being uh, recommended are acceptable, and that is just saying that uh, any employee who was employed by the district as of September the 1st of 2018 and continued to be employed by the district as of, as of December the 1st, 2018, um, would receive, if they're a full-time employee, and that means that they're exceeding 20 hours per week on their normal schedule, they would receive a $600 gross pay uh, incentive. And if they're a part-time employee, they would receive a $300 gross pay incentive. Uh, of course, I say gross because that's before taxes. And again, that's here as a, rec as a suggestion recommendation, but we're definitely open to um, feedback from the board as to what y'all think about the dates or the amounts, knowing that we have a $1.8 million amount that's currently allocated for that. What were the dates again? Um, September the 1st through December the 1st. And it would be paid out in December. September 1st, 2018? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Ms. Pichelle. Thank you. Um, my question is, Dr. Ball, um, is this something that we're going to continue to bring back each year, or is this going to be a one-time thing? For what, for right now, I would say it would be a one-time thing. Ms. Knoyer. I, I really want to pay our employees who have remained with us. But I'm not sure the September 1 date is kind of what we had in mind. I'm thinking of people who were here last year who didn't leave us, and not necessarily the new employees. Correct. That was my question. Is that what we did last year? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, last time we did this. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you asking one of the other board members? Okay. We, um, we adopted it a lot earlier. Um, it was in the November, like November 2016, December 2017, 2016, something like that. And it was for the, for, to let it, you know, people know that it was anybody who was working at a certain point during that school year and continued to, who came back the following school year. So it was um, spanning two different school years. And, it was, and the intent of that point, I mean, it really was a retention incentive mm -hmm. uh, because it was adopted a lot earlier to let employees know. The difference with this one is it's being adopted a little bit later. And so it just depends on whatever criteria y'all want. The idea was, uh, in suggesting those dates, it was to try to include as many of the employees that are employed by the district um, because we were unable to adjust compensation plans this year. Um, and I know that that's not, I mean, it's supposed to be a retention incentive. Mm -hmm. um, but that was part of the thinking between, you know, when we put those dates together was to try to, just with the realization that we really didn't adjust the teacher scale uh, this year because we didn't provide a salary increase and this would offset a little bit of that. So if we, if we did it, let's say, I'm just throwing out ideas. If we said June 1st versus September 1st, that would not, that would then eliminate, I guess, new employees who were hired in during for the, the summer. school year, correct? But it would still give an incentive to employees who worked last year sure. and then are still with us and sure. stayed with us. Sure. Okay. I would, I would like to, from September to June 1st. That's just my opinion. From September 1st. I'm sorry. September. From, from sep first. change of September first date to June first, okay. and then go and so keep and, and keep your right the second okay. right. That's my recommendation. Any thoughts? Mr. Shaw. 
Ms. And that, that's what the employees were already, they already knew that, right? They already knew that it would be those employees that worked through December, no? No, oh, uh, December. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, this, this just came about recently. So this really, it had, no one really, I don't say no one, but this isn't something that has really been publicized for our, our staff. This was discussed at uh, two meetings ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I guess my question is, it, we're using the same criteria that we used last year. That's what, I'm, that's what I wanna know. It's not the exact criteria because the date parameters are being, are because different. Because of the dates, but I'm just saying the qualifiers are the same, Be, working through one year to the next was the was the purpose of the retention. Yes, okay. I mean that part of it is is accurate. It was okay. um, it's going to uh, transcend two school two school okay. years, uh, but the dates are are drastically different because last year, I believe it was that you were employed beginning December the first of twenty seventeen twenty six except sixteen, and it went through. Um, through August or September of 2017, and then we paid it in December of 2017. It was for a lot longer term, and, and again, we did it in advance, so we told the employees, we adopted it in November, and mm -hmm. it was looking forward. Um, so, okay. uh, and that's the only, it, it will work, but that's the only difference here is that we're kind of going back. Is the time frame. Right, uh, instead okay. of just looking forward. So with this current plan, every single employee is gonna get something? Um, if they are hired between September the 1st and December the 1st, and say here through December the 1st, yes, okay. that, that right. is correct. Um, the majority of the employees that leave during that time are usually our, auxiliary. we have a lot of turnover in the auxiliary right, ranks, but, but mostly the professional, all teach, mostly the teachers, they will be here during that right. time. So majority that, of the staff are gonna be receiving, if we keep it the way it is right now. That's correct. The majority of the staff, if we change it, then anybody hired new, mm -hmm. any new hires, would not receive it. Would not receive it. They wouldn't be eligible. Okay. That's correct. And we have budgeted for every, every. Uh, I'm going to say that the majority of the employees to receive it is what is budgeted yes, here for 3,000 employees. Right. Yes. Now uh, we are. I mean, that does obviously say that some people will be leaving and not be eligible, um, but the majority of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Messier. I'm trying to, to remember, and, and I may have, because we've done this a few times now uh, over the last several years. Was there um, where legal had to give advice in terms of us not going back? Remember that whole discussion where we had Walsh Anderson involved in helping us uh, put a timeline? Walsh, Diane. Do you remember? I'm trying to recall. I know that they always talk about not uh, paying people. Uh, retroactively, uh, this is a little bit different because we're not really paying them for that time. Okay. We're just saying that's one of the qualifiers. We definitely, depending on what the board recommends, we definitely um, can ask legal, even if it's after the fact, just to make sure that we're not doing anything that's inappropriate. And if there's a problem, we would bring it back to the board. But um, I don't really remember them giving us guidance on this specific issue with the dates. I do remember them talking about uh, retention, we did consult with them about doing the retention incentive and make sure that we could do it. Um, and they were very comfortable with the way we did it last time, uh, last year. Uh, with this particular one, if, you know, we would, of course, like I said, um, visit with them about it. And if they had any concerns, we would let the board know if there was any legal issues that they were concerned about. Okay. Yeah, I just remember that. And, and it, it looks like um, last time we did it, we didn't have to pay all 1.8 million out because certain employees didn't meet the criteria. This one, it looks like they'll, we're gonna have 90% of them plus meet the criteria. Um, so this is almost an appreciation incentive rather than a retention incentive, which is, is fine. But um, I, I don't expect us to, 90% is what I expect to, uh, to be spent on that. Ms. Bichelle. So are we gonna change the date? For That's all I want to know. <laughs> we can change the date to be June 1st. And if y'all would like to do that, just please make a motion right. to, we'll have to amend, to it. amend it. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. 
it's up to, I mean, we can, I, I see positives in, <laughs> in both ways. Ms. Knoyer. Um, because we have budgeted to cover all employees, I came into this thinking that we were doing the retention incentive. Um, but we do know that there's going to be a slight increase in um, health insurance. And we know that um, without a pay raise, that does affect all employees, even though, I mean, even the ones who weren't here last year, the health insurance from wherever that came from, uh, there's going to be a difference. So I actually think I might be okay with leaving it as it is. If there's no further, if there's no further discussion, we'll proceed to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six zero. Six A. Superintendent report. Construction report. Yes, um, I'd like to ask. Oh, maybe I'll remember one time. <laughs> I'd like to ask Dr. Fields uh, to please update us on this. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the construction projects for the district have ramped up um, with us getting closer to the 18-19 school year. For the 10 schools that we identified as the modernization and improvement schools, which are Converse, Park Village, Woodlake, Candlewood, Crestview, Spring Meadows, Eloff, Millers Point, Olympia, and Peshaw, we're still in the architectural contract negotiation phase. And um, their designing goes from uh, kitchens at some of the campuses all the way to the the establishment of a new gymnasium at another one so um, we're working diligently on getting that done in addition to our bond initiative we also have insurance projects that are being done the six critical roofs of Eloff Hopkins Masters Park Village and Peshaw and Wagner Eloff and Hopkins are complete uh, Masters and Park Village are 99 or sorry Masters and Peshaw are 99 percent complete and then Park Village and Wagner are about 98% complete. So we're at the closeout phase on both of those, on all of those critical roofs. And we're moving forward with phase two and phase three of the insurance projects that needed to be done. And um, once we put that out for uh, construction bidding, our plan is to start phase two construction in about mid-October. Now concerning the renovations for Kitty Hawk Middle School and Kirby Middle School, at Kitty Hawk Middle School, we had said before that we needed to expedite that. We got in touch with, CPS got back with us today and said that they're ready to cut the power over at Kitty Hawk and establish the new electrical easement so we can go into the next school year. That'll start next Friday and probably run through the admin summit on um, April 2nd, and then the power will be back on over there. And then for Kirby, we're in negotiation with the general contractor that was approved last board meeting. And then finally, um, veterans, not finally, but phase two of veterans, remember that we're doing um, a new academic building, which will increase their capacity to 2,400 students, as well as a fine arts center. And we're about 60% done with the design over there. But what we did do, and you approved earlier, was separate the athletic fields so we can start on that construction quicker, so they'll be able to use those varsity fields a lot quicker in terms of getting all the construction done at the same time. And then Escondido, we, um, the substantial completion was supposed to be for tomorrow, is what we've been telling you. Um, that was completed today. Um, we haven't received the certificate of occupancy yet. The fire marshal has been, uh, um, he identified some areas. All those areas were corrected. So either he'll go back out tomorrow or on Monday and we should receive the certificate of occupancy so we can move forward with that as well. We also set up a tour for um, the board as well as the senior staff on the 26th of August to go out so you can see the new facility before everybody starts getting in. It'll be a little bit busy because we'll be putting in, in equipment at, I'm sorry, did I say August? August? Yeah. I apologize. It's 26 <laughs> July, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to give them more time. I was trying to give them more time. <laughs> 26th of July, yes. And um, it'll be, they'll be moving in equipment and stuff like that, so it'll be a little bit busy. But I don't think we'll need hard hats and vests and all the other stuff. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Dr. Fields, the, does this also include the vestibules? Um, 
for the, the campuses where vestibules were ordered, yes, ma'am, that's mostly in the modernization and improvement on those 10 schools that we're, we're, we're working on. There is one campus that we're moving forward with, and we've asked that maintenance take over to expedite getting that vestibule done, which is Hartman Elementary. Yes. So they're going to start working on uh, establishing, I know that our architects are drawing that up right now, and then they're going to hand that over to maintenance, and they're going to establish the vestibule at, at Hartman a little bit quicker because there's a, a great need for it. Ms. Bishop. So our, our guys are going to uh, put up the vestibules. Not We're not going to have to contract that? They're, they're going to be in charge of the construction of it. Some of it they may have to contract out. Some of it they may do on their own. But um, the, the maintenance department is going to be in charge of that rather than us going to find a contractor to do to, it. For yeah. yeah. Oh, that's and then cool. our architect is drawing it up. Yes. Okay. All right. That's good. Okay, if there's no further discussion, 6B, update and comprehensive study on students on grade level and above. Mr. Macias. First, I'd like to thank administration for doing a really good job uh, on getting this started. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I read every page twice, and so I have a couple of really easy questions, I think. Um, we had talked uh, and had some discussion in our last meeting, um, I don't know how many months ago now, of engaging teachers and so having teachers involved in the process in some capacity. I know during the summer they're not on contract, they're not here, but I was hopeful that this initial plan uh, that is being developed that will at some point during the academic year involve teachers in recommendations. Is that still something that could be accomplished, uh, Dr. Ball? Yes, um, I'm asking uh, Dr. Ganthu to take the lead on this um, and assist us with this. Ms. Mr. Davis is not taking the lead? No, um, I asked Dr. Gunther. Very well, mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Macias, um, I believe the question that you're asking about teachers getting involved and making recommendations, are you asking specifically for the involvement with like, for example, college readiness in the curriculum development piece? Um, any, 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 the vision I should say is any stakeholder involved in the instructional process. So any instructional aides, instructional staff members, uh, coordinators, anyone and everyone that may have a recommendation on what they're seeing in the field that could help us kind of evaluate our internal processes and, and have sort of a stamp of, of uh, not approval, but you know, their stamp on it. That's what I'm thinking. Th thank you so much for the clarification. Uh, one of the things that has happened this summer is um, we have had a team of teachers working on curriculum development. Mm -hmm. The curriculum development included, uh, including, included some college readiness pieces. So this was created by teachers for teachers. Uh, so we took some of the best teachers, their recommendations, their suggestions. Um, so that curriculum we're excited about for our district. We believe that it's going to have a very positive impact on our students because we had several departments come together to, to work together and get this done. So yes, sir, to answer your question, we did have teachers involved in the curriculum piece to make sure that not only curriculum but also the college readiness piece, uh, there was input from teachers at all grade levels. Okay. And the other comment as I was reviewing the data was um, having sort of a snapshot of where we are in relation to the county or to the state. Um, we had conversations about being number one. So this assessment now tells us where we are, but where are we in comparison to other districts so that we can get to that number one status. So just so we have an idea, I love that there were benchmarks that were showing annual year-over-year -year returns, which was phenomenal. But then how does that compare? I mean, we know internally what it looks like, but externally, uh, when we're trying to compete, what does that look like? Um, and uh, if we could get that, um, that would be helpful. Uh, and at that, that's all I have. I mean, there's, there's obviously more, but, but those were the main points I wanted to as we continue the evaluation. <laughs> you're smiling, Ms. Davis. I'm kind of curious. I just... Oh, you're good. Okay. <laughs> and I just wanted to come back, Mr. Macias, and let you know that uh, we will have some updated information. I've shared briefly with our superintendent. Um, we have updated information from the state regarding college readiness piece. So the information that you've asked will be included in the near future once we've had an opportunity to discuss it. So it, it's 
coming shortly. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if there's no further discussion, 6C, discuss professional development programming, mentor programs, and PD surveys. Mr. Macias. I had a question regarding mentoring uh, specifically. Um, I, I wanted to get an idea of what the cost was for the program. How much are we spending annually on a mentor program? And so that's, that's something if we can get in the future, that'd be very helpful. Um, thank you, Ms. Davis, for putting it together. I see your name all over it again, so thank you. The uh, only question I had obviously was budget and then the um, measurability of the program. How, uh, I will tell you that I've spoke with some teachers randomly in the district, um, one, some of which have said that they did not have a relationship with their mentor or they were not aware of who their mentor is. And so I thought, okay, well, how are we validating that this dialogue is occurring? Are we documenting it or, you know, what is that looking like? And then naturally, I would imagine we have our best teachers doing the mentoring, which then if we're evaluating turnover rates, what does that look like with retention? It should be easy to determine teachers that are into this program, what does that specific retention rate look like? And if it's high, then I think we have opportunity to truly look at what that program looks like and find out what type of support our teachers zero to three need in, in terms of continuing to keep them in the district, um, at least to do our part. Maybe it's compensation and that's nothing we can really change, but we can certainly change the support. So uh, all this is about retention. So if we can find out what that information is, how effective and impactful the mentor program is, and that we're not just putting out stipends just because we're going through the motions, that there's actual visible, visible measurability about what we're trying to do with that money. But I, again, I just would love to know what a ballpark budget item is for this. Do are we spending 200,000 a year or any, any idea? Um, a couple things. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Davis for putting all this information together. I could thank tell you. it took a lot of time. Um, secondly, I, I would like to let everybody know that we quickly realize this is an area of concern and, and growth um, that we need in regards to having a program that supports our new teachers to include the mentoring component. So um, we've already started to develop something, but again, it is gonna be too late for this 2018-19 school year. Um, but we have already contacted Region 20. We'll be working with them because they have done an excellent job in many other systems to put together something. You go, go ahead. I made successful contact with Region 20. And yeah, we she contacted be, me. <laughs> yes, and we will be implementing a mentor program this year that will include online metrics, that will include monthly support for our new teachers. Um, and it's also going to include um, in-classroom support for the teachers as well as pull-out support for the new teachers um, in the school district. In addition to support for the mentors for the teachers, that online program is able to provide metrics as to the activities that the mentors are doing with the teachers so that we can ensure that that money is spent wisely. And to answer the question, it is, it has been in the past $250 per semester for a total of $500 per lead mentor times the number of campuses that we have. So it's one lead mentor per the number of campuses. So in high school, it's one lead mentor. In elementary, it's one lead, yes. so. For the, who work specifically with the new teachers. So yes, one sir. mentor, per, per, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at the high school, obviously, we're seeing a <coughs> lot more yes, teachers. Sir. Yes, sir. And, and when we're dealing with at-risk populations, there, there are unique challenges that deal yes. with students that are economically disadvantaged. Um, it would be interesting to see what the turnover rate has been consistently in that segment of zero to three, which I know that data exists, in terms of how we're supporting them. And maybe we need to add a, an additional mentor at the high school level. Um, so are there lead mentors as well as mentors? Yes, there are individual mentors um, that serve with grade level specific team leaders that, that work directly with teachers, but there's only one identified lead mentor who then works with the additional mentors um, who work with the mentees. But I will say that to help that, especially at the high school level, um, the in-classroom support that we will be receiving monthly from Region 20 will be a great uh, improvement in that area this yeah. coming school year. Well, it, it, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. And, and the other part of um, 
Well, this agenda item had everything to do with professional development. And so we've discussed in the past relevant PD for employees. We had a survey, and I was looking everywhere for it. I'm going to have to look at my emails, where we conducted a survey two years ago on professional development. And that survey indicated that our teachers needed more support in classroom management, specific. That was one of the highest percentiles. And so I wanted to follow that up with, have we done anything to support teachers to give them relevant PD in classroom management? Or is there just a certain playbook, if you will, that they need to take because they need to qualify whatever those credits are. Uh, so uh, I just need more information about that, and, and obviously uh, Dr. Ball will, I'm certain, look into that a little bit deeper as well. But the, the whole topic of relevant PD is, is, is important, I think. So um, I, di I didn't see anything on PD, so I know it's fresh and we're just we're discussing it, so I don't expect anything right now. Mm -hmm. But um, I certainly would like some follow-up on that. Absolutely. Ms. I'm sorry, Ms. Eaton. Um, <laughs> can, I, can I ask the staff member the question? Yes. Oh, okay. So where can I locate the in-processing sheet for the new teachers and or the mentor checklist that they go by during this process? I would like to look at one so I can see what it is that they are. We can most certainly provide it in the next um, Friday pamphlet that yes. goes out. Thank you. You're welcome. Could you repeat that you asked for two things, in-processing sheet and? Um, the in-processing sheet for mm -hmm. the new teachers mm -hmm. processing into the district, mm -hmm. as well as the checklist That's the one I missed. Too. that they use for this mentor program. I just want to get an idea of what, what the mentors are doing at each level to assist the teachers. Thank you. Thank you. And I did see to speak to Mr. Macias's question about classroom management or discipline. I, I don't remember where I saw it, if it was in the consulting services or in your comprehensive data review um, about PBIS. So we have quite a few campuses that have gone through, it looks like extensive training already for PBIS, which addresses the concern um, for discipline. And also, you receive a quarterly report, and the last two quarterly reports you've received from me have included every single professional development that has been offered by the district. And there has been plenty of classroom uh, management pieces, as well as even in the content area, what we do within the classroom should help manage the content by ensuring that the student instruction is engaging. And that also helps with classroom management. But we understand that there's also a piece that's just facilitating classroom management, and that type of professional learning has been offered as well. And on page 192, um, you're able to see a lead mentor agreement where it talks about some of the responsibilities that we expect from our lead mentors. So that's listed on page 192 of your board book. It, it, oh. Cool. So, Michelle. You're, you're, you're referring to, um, we got quite a few emails this week, or last week was it? That was the um, quarterly reports? That's what you're referring to? Yes, okay. ma'am. All right, thanks. Ms. Yes. And I haven't read those three. They're all right there in my inbox, but I will be looking at them yes, more sir. in depth. Um, so uh, I guess this criteria of, on page 192, the lead mentor agreement, Right now, um, again, Dr. Ball had mentioned there's some areas of improvement yes. for here and opportunity. So at this point, who does ensure that this happens? So it had a fallen under the Office of Professional Learning. The Office of Professional Learning has shifted this year. It started in HR and it shifted over to CNI. But since uh, I've been here for this last semester, it has been it has fallen under the CNI purview. Okay. So um, since I've been here, we have held two quarterly mentor meetings over the last two quarters that I've been here, but we do realize that that's an opportunity for growth, and we are definitely taking those measures to ensure that we have an effective program, a program that follows up with the new teachers both in best practices area as well as um, classroom management area, and that we have the metrics that you need to ensure that money's being used wisely. The, I guess the last thing I would want then in terms of the PBI, PBIS and, and training and so on, there's always a track record of what we've offered before. I would be satisfied to see that there was an increase in, in intervention or classroom management as opposed to year over year. 
what I'm concerned about and is that it's just the same menu of professional development without really increasing. So I would feel better and sleep better at night once I knew that there was an increased pathway for more classroom management PD that, that again, I call relevant PD for our employees. So if that can be provided, Dr. Ball, with administration. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further discussion, we'll move on to item 60. Update on board training, conferences, events, and consider future agenda item requests by board members. We'll start with Mr. LaFoyle. Nothing. Thank you. Ms. Knoyer? I have nothing at this time. Mr. Macias? Nothing present. Thank you. Ms. Eaton? Nothing. Thank you. Ms. Pichon? I don't have anything other than uh, just clarity. I'm always asking for clarity. So um, the items that were pulled tonight, will they be on August agenda, Dr. Ball? I will work diligently okay. to, <laughs> to, to get it done. Um, I, my priorities right now will be to assist the campuses to get okay. ready for the first day. And I mean no disrespect, but Absolutely. you know, I want to make sure we're fully hired and ready for the first day of class for students because that will be quickly upon us. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I will be keep you updated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because the only the reason why I asked is because that uh, item B that was the emergency management, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know if that was something, it, a person that we need to have right away. Right. It, I don't consider that at this time something okay. urgent. That I urgent. think that we okay. have staff that can take care of things for Thank you. time being. Okay, the, the only thing that I have is, oh, I'm sorry. The only thing that I have is just a reminder that if you do have any requests, board members, they should go directly, be emailed please directly to Dr. Ball, to the board president and to Ms. Holmes. Dr. Ball will determine the process for responses. Board members in their capacity as a board member should not send any requests verbally, email or text directly to any cabinet members or any employees in their capacity as a board member. Certainly if you're a parent, that's a whole other, uh, that's a whole other situation. But if you have any requests or when you have requests, because we do have quite a few requests, please make sure that you email Dr. Ball, the board president and Ms. Holmes and Dr. Ball will determine the process for responses. So just a reminder, okay? And we will move on then to 7A, closed session, pursuant to Texas Government Code, section 551.074, discussing personnel, the personnel report and updates including new hires, resignations, and administrative appointments, one, principals. B, pursuant to Texas Government Code, sections 551.071, private consultation with the board's attorney to discuss retention of Gravely and Pearson LLP with regard to potential construction defects at Converse Elementary. The board will now adjourn into closed session pursuant or will now adjourn into closed session and the time is 758.